So I've come to Bath today to meet with Dr. Robin Fackrell, who some of you might remember from our early um, videos. Lovely to see you. And you. And um, so the first topic we're going to talk about is cognitive decline. Um, so do many people with Parkinson's experience some sort of cognitive decline, either, either later on in the condition or maybe a bit earlier? So we know that patients on their Parkinson's journey do experience um, some cognitive changes. It's n by no means inevitable that this will happen, uh, but typically people, we do see changes um, with neurocognition uh, as the Parkinson's journey um, develops. And what sort of changes are there? I mean, memory loss could be one thing, I guess. Is, is there also difficulty thinking? Yes. So typically what we see is problems with what I call executive function. So cognitive processing and sequencing. Think about, I don't know, filling in a form or doing internet banking or something like that. Finding it more difficult to sort of navigate through that process and perhaps needing some help or some prompting from others. And that can develop into challenges where you do need help and prompting to do um, other things um, uh, that everyday life might uh, might require. Um, sometimes it can be very subtle, uh, um, and sometimes it can be more marked. Other things that people do mention are um, problems with perception. So uh, a common feeling is a sensation of presence or passing. So somebody might develop the sensation of having somebody behind them, but when they turn around, there's nobody there. Um, so, so what sort of things should I look out for as early warning signs of cognitive decline? I sometimes think that um, <clears throat> it's the observer uh, that has a keener eye when it comes to what to look out for. Um, because sometimes, because um, things are very, very insidious, the person with Parkinson's doesn't necessarily notice them. But sometimes they may notice a little bit more difficulty with those everyday tasks. I mentioned you know, internet banking or following, filling in a form or that kind of thing might just become a bit more challenging. And that might then indicate uh, that uh, there are issues that need to be investigated. But I think we should always think it doesn't necessarily signify yeah. cognitive deterioration. What it might signify is that the medications need uh, adjusting or that they're the dopamine levels are a bit low or those kinds of things. It could be that there's other things going on uh, and in which case we, um, you know, we can investigate that. But I think it's having our antennae up to yeah. notice change because once we notice change, we can then evaluate things and then we can look to see whether there needs to be any changes or whether it does signify something uh, more challenging that we do need to deal with. So it's an interesting point you raise about, as I, I noticed some, there's some natural variation in my cognitive ability. So, so for example, I play a lot of online Scrabble, and I definitely play much better when I'm on medication than when I'm in an off state. Yeah. Um, and I, I also get tired from the condition, and when I'm tired, of course, I'm a bit slower in my thought processes. So there's not necessarily an underlying change in my cognition, but it, it fluctuates throughout the day, I think. Yeah. And I think we know that dopamine and attention and concentration are linked. Mm. And so when we have low dopamine levels, it's not just that you can feel the symptoms of motor Parkinson's get worse, like tremor, rigidity, those kinds of things, but non-motor symptoms can get worse too. So you can feel more anxious. You can feel that you're a bit more cognitively foggy, not quite as fired. Um, you know, and, and so it's just about being aware of those variations, as you say, and perhaps linking that to activity. So if, you're, if you know you're going to be more off in the later afternoon, don't plan to do something that's going to require higher cognitive function, perhaps. Or taking medication like dispersible Madapar, for example, that will lift the dopamine levels and enable you to be able to do that. So yeah, it's about recognizing those natural fluctuations. Uh, and that might change day to day. Um, so, so if my um, partner or, or spouse or whatever um, starts to notice maybe a more more significant change in cognition, I, I should obviously refer that to my, my neurologist. And what sort of tests might they do to determine what's wrong? So uh, Parkinson specialists, when they're, when they're focused on uh, cognition, will, will first of all do a holistic assessment. And that holistic assessment will look to make sure that there's nothing else going on. You know, could you be very badly constipated and that's causing challenges? Could you have issues are you not sleeping and that's why your cognition is worse so an evaluation more globally then look at the medications are they working for you are you showing signs of depression uh, are you unduly anxious and is that affecting cognition 
We then do some cognitive screening tools, but they're just screens. They, 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 you get a score, but that's just an indicator. It's not a diagnostic um, thing. And we do things, uh, what we typically do is something called a mini Adambrooks cognitive examination, which is a 30 point score. Um, and that looks at various aspects of, of cognition, looking at executive functioning and processing, visuospatial things, recall. And that gives us an idea about areas of the brain which perhaps aren't working quite so well. And then we can uh, look to see whether that is consistent with the history of the cognitive decline. And then that leads us to um, suggesting whether there is cognitive impairment or whether there's something else that we need to address. So if there is genuine significant cognitive impairment, impairment is there something I can do about that? Are there some new drugs, for example, that might slow that down? Or? So cognitive impairment, um, the drugs that we use in Parkinson's disease, the most evidence is with the cholinesterase inhibitors, uh, something called rivastigmine. And rivastigmine uh, can be used either as tablets uh, or somewhat better tolerated is uh, the rivastigmine patch. Um, and that can be to be given. Now that can work in a number of ways. It can reduce those sensations of presence and passing um, and hallucinations uh, if they're present. And it can also serve to improve attention and concentration and help with uh, the memory dysfunction. There's another medication called memantine, which is an alternative medication that we use when people have sort of moderate cognitive problems or dementia. Um, and that can um, also help. And we sometimes use those medications in combination. There are newer medications that are being talked about in, in the Alzheimer's yeah. uh, world. Um, and uh, these are infusion therapies. Um, and there's uh, a strong possibility that that might be something that is thought about in, in other neurodegenerative conditions, such as Parkinson's disease. But there's nothing at the moment that uh, we are routinely using um, for cognition like the Alzheimer's world. Uh, that touches on another question. Is it possible to get Alzheimer's and Parkinson's at the same time or, or different combinations of neurodegenerative conditions? So whilst it's possible um, to get those two conditions happening, it'd be unusual. Um, Alzheimer's uh, is one of those conditions will predominate. Uh, and sometimes people have Parkinson's disease with cognitive decline, which might be sort of akin and similar to Alzheimer's, but it's probably more linked to the Parkinson's pathology than the Alzheimer's one. And vice versa. Um, because they're quite different mechanisms, aren't they? It's different the, proteins. Yes. Well, so and so on. Tau is the main thing in Alzheimer's and alpha-synuclein is the main thing in Parkinson's. They cannot regulate one another. Sometimes the medications for Alzheimer's can give rise to Parkinsonism. Uh, and sometimes there, you know, there are different reasons why uh, patients can develop Parkinsonian symptoms and have Alzheimer's pathology. But um, I guess that's for the specialist to try to, uh, to work out which one is predominating. So final question, is there anything I can do for myself in terms of diet or exercise, things like that, to either reduce the chances of, of this cognitive impairment or, or slow it down if it does happen? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's lots of evidence about activity. So staying physically active, <clears throat> aerobic exercise, high intensity training exercise, if you're able to, um, is possibly the best kind of exercise. But being active, no matter what that looks like, I talk about exercise snacking, where you say to somebody, go to the gym for 40 minutes, they might not want to do that. But if you say, could you do some exercise three minutes, three times a day. So that's less than 10 minutes. So walk up example, the stairs or something like yeah, that. Yeah, walk up the stairs, get it in and out of the chair as many times as you can in three minutes. That will really stress those important muscles, will get you going aerobically, will reduce the risk of muscle deconditioning and also you know, keep you active. Um, and that then puts you in a better uh, state, puts the brain in a better state. But I think if um, you're able to, being as active as you can, um, eating well, uh, so we know that eating clean, if you like, reduced ultra-processed foods and all those kinds of things do help uh, going forward, uh, reduce the likelihood of, um, of developing cognitive challenge and dementia. So it's the sensible things, isn't it? It's about eating well, it's about exercising, uh, getting plenty of sleep, all of those things that... Um, uh, Good for you anyway, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. that you'd imagine. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you.